the evening of a half-term holiday, and I'm actually surprised that so many people have decided to come and join us tonight. Maybe it's easier on a Monday during the half-term than it is um, on, a, on a week. So you should be able to hear my voice now at the moment, but Tammy's saying she can't, so just other people were saying before that they could hear me. You should be able to hear me okay, so let me just type a message in. Yeah, so some people can hear me. So just check your speakers, Tammy. Now, I've I've got an agenda for tonight's meeting. And what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to pop that on our screen so we can see what that looks like. Now, I've been using this particular platform for doing these webinars. This is probably about the 10th or 12th one I've done using this. And I'm still just getting used to it. So I'm finding... To begin with, um, it's easier for me if, if I talk through things and then watch the chat. So there's like a little chat window that you should be able to access and type messages into. And and I keep, I've got two screens. I've got my laptop, which has got a webcam on, which I'm looking at now. And then I have another screen over here on my right where I can read what's going on in the chat. So you should now be able to see my what I've got on my desktop, which is a document that looks like this. And I've shared a link for this document. It's there at the very top. Just highlighting it now. It's there. It says tinyurl.com slash teachcomputingwebinar. So I, my name is Alan O'Donoghue. I teach computing at Our Ladies Catholic High School in Preston. I'm actually in the school building at, at the moment. I'm probably the only, well, I am. I can see I'm the only person in school. And um, I started teaching computing in about the year 2010, and we started at GCSE in 2011. I feel like I've had lots of experiences. Some of them have been good and some have been bad, but I've learned from all of them. And I'm trying to do what I can to share these with you. I have an agenda for tonight. So from now till half past six, there's a couple of things I'm going to mention. And I'll come up to Twitter hashtags and Facebook groups in just a moment. Uh, the computing school notifications. I was at a meeting the other day where some people were saying that they were struggling to, to make them work for them. So I'm going to show you a few tips that you might not know about. Um, I want to mention some more about Jam Pact, which is a project that I've recently received funding on. And then something practical that, that I've tried lots of times to engage and inspire the learners that I'm working with. And I'm hoping that it's something that you can try yourself. So mostly for the first half an hour or so, it's it's not specifically about GCSE computing, but then at 6.30 till 6.45, the plan is that we'll look at some elements to do with teaching the GCSE. So I've got a couple of things I'm going to point you towards then. And then um, Ben, James, and Craig have sent in questions, which I'm going to try and address in the last 15 minutes segment. But if you... Um, if you've got some questions, I might give you yours priority because you're here and they aren't here. Ex oh, Jane, hey, Craig is. So I'll, so I'll definitely prioritize Craig. Craig, that's what I'm going to do now. i move it to the very top. There you go, Craig. Now, um, so I'm going to go oh. just back to the beginning. And this is the bit I want to focus on just for a moment. So I know that Twitter isn't um, everybody's particular cup of tea, but I... I'm a, I'm, I love using Twitter. I, I mean, I do find it's quite addictive. Um, there's, a, there's, a, yeah, there's a few jokes to go around with that. I went to see the doctor the other day and I told him that, you know, I, I'm on Twitter all the time and I can't stop. And he said, don't worry, it's perfectly tweetable. But I'm, Shh. And, uh, and I said, no, no, honestly, I, I, I can't stop using it all the time. He said, I'm sorry, I don't follow you. I thought, oh, no, that's Facebook, isn't it? Oh, no, that, that is Twitter. But anyway, back to the serious stuff. Um, if you're not already using Twitter, there are loads and loads of little discussions and little nuggets of information that you can find when you're on there. And um, one thing that people use when they're on Twitter, and you don't actually have to have a Twitter account to use these, is these hashtags. And there's five different ones, one, two, three, four, five, that I've been following quite a lot over the last few days or so. So I just want to tell you a little bit about them. And then some of them are blue. So you've got links, and some of them I haven't finished quite yet. But Comp Ed UK. So 
that's a hashtag which I'm going to click on now that Andy Colley who's a teacher up in Manchester computing teacher he suggested the other day that well we all try and use this hashtag but what happens is the hashtag is a way of unifying and bringing lots of discussions together and um, I mean, I, I, what I, I hope that you you understand and realize is that there's thousands of teachers out there who are discovering lots of uh, great strategies and processes and things that they can do with their classes and some of them are using this Comped UK hashtag to share them so there I just mentioned Andy Colley a moment ago and um, what he's found some some article online about security and he thinks you know it's relevant to school in some way so he's put this on here so Comped UK is meant to stand for computing education in the UK and here we can see Mark Scott uh, he's written a blog post about his GCSE computing class so um, I would come back and visit that from time to time and you can see some people have tweeted photographs with a certain link to it. <laughs> um, William Lau, I've met William in London, he found a podcast that, that, that links back to that document that I was just referring to a moment ago. Another one was MozFest, so I'm not really sure if you know what MozFest is, but MozFest is a... Um, a big festival that's just happened um, Saturday, Sunday in London and unfortunately I couldn't get there this year but, but I went last year and I took my two children with me and they were really obsessed as well that they couldn't go this year but it, it's just fantastic it's at Ravensbourne College and it's right next to the O2 arena in London in Greenwich and there's nine floors all together and there's lots of different things for lots of different people all to take part in and I found last week, last year, I came over with loads of different ideas. So, that, like for example, something I'm going to mention now is uh, Twine is a tool that I've been using to help children write their own interactive adventures. I'll add a link later to that. And it's something that we're taking on our jam-packed roadshow. And it was just getting to meet educators from all over the world. And it wasn't free. I think it cost me about forty pounds last year to go, to, like, to actually be there and to provide food and you get vouchers for drink and all sorts of stuff. But it's a. Well, why am I telling you afterwards? Well, because if you click on it now, you'll still see lots of people are tweeting pictures of what went on, but you'll find links to resources that people have been sharing and activities that they've been working on. So, by all means, you know, later on, go and. Go look up the, the MozFest hashtag, like here for example. So um, Ben wasn't at MozFest, but there was some discussion about a Firefox operating system being developed for Raspberry Pi. So you go there, you click on that, and now uh, straight away we're into some resources that have been shared online. A wiki all about the Firefox OS on the Raspberry Pi. So the thing I found about the hashtags was I couldn't be at MozFest and there was a couple of other things I wanted to be at and I couldn't but it just it, it makes me feel like I can still get those access to those little nuggets of gold you know the resources and things that people are sharing online ideas for activities and if you do use Twitter it means you get to, to you know make new friends as well at the same time you know you might be able to spot one of your friends in that photograph there so uh, that that's pretty much wrapped it up for hashtags but I'll just tell you what these other things were so Hack Manchester, this was an event that was taking place at the Museum of Science and Industry in Manchester. It's this week, it's Manchester Science Festival. And there was about two or three hundred software developers, hackers, geeks, all working together. And um, you get to, if you, if you look at that hashtag, you get to see the kind of things that they were working on. Uh, the Manchester Science Festival, so I, I did actually get to, to go down and visit on Saturday and there was lots of different things, a lot of it relevant to what we're teaching. So they had a, a 3D exhibition, 3D printing exhibition, so you can see lots of examples. There was, a, there was a bicycle there that the frame had been 3D printed and uh, what else? They had lots of, they had robots and uh, <laughs> just, just so much stuff going on. In fact, on Wednesday this week, there's a Raspberry Pi robot type of programming session that you can sign up for. And these last two hashtags, it's like I'm, I feel like I'm reading the news, telling you some things that are going on at the moment. So it's the Google Teacher Academy, so it's GTA UK, and that's taking place uh, today and tomorrow in London. But again, I've been following that hashtag. Um, 
and it's it's just an, an interesting way of keeping abreast of what's going on. And then the other one um, is Pi Academy. So there's a bunch of our 20 teachers. They're probably having a meal somewhere right now in Cambridge. They've spent all day learning how to, they've had a physical workshop, sorry, physical computing workshop with Clive Beale from the Raspberry Pi Foundation. Carrie Ann's been giving them lots of ideas and inspiration, what you can do with your Raspberry Pi. There's um, a friend of mine, Les Pounder. He's been down there today to show them what you can do with the Pi Brella. That's an add-on hardware board for the Raspberry Pi. And Martin O'Hanlon, I think he's been there doing some Minecraft workshops with them today. And there'll be lots more stuff happening tomorrow. But lots of these people, because they're quite active on Twitter, they'll be sharing and tweeting links to resources that you can then make use of yourself. Now, I, I've never really been a fan of Facebook. I, I, I'm not quite sure. I found like, this idea that people say that Twitter, like Facebook is for the people that you went to school with, and Twitter is for the people that you wished you went to school with. Um, I've just never really bought into the whole Facebook thing. But there are some discussion groups on Facebook, which I'm going to add links into. I can't do, because I'm actually in school now, I'm not allowed to use Facebook in school, so, so I'm, I can't add them in, but I will add them in later on. But there's been some discussions on Facebook around some of the GCSE computing tasks. Some of it's got a little bit close to the kind of thing that you're allowed to discuss. And um, it's just, it's another way that you can discuss with people, you know, I get share ideas and resources for what you're doing. Now, all of this links into the next thing I want to talk about, which is the computing at school notifications. Now, when I mention computing at school to some people at some of the hub meetings, some of them go, oh my goodness. Yeah, like I get an email every day. It's just got stacks of stuff. And I just, there, isn't just, there just isn't enough time in a day to, to be able to go through and, and, and read all of them. And um, so what I'm going to do now, I'm going to do a little demonstration of what you can do to tailor this, to make it work for you so you can get the best from the Computing at School uh, forum and resources and community. And I'm just going to pause for a moment just to say, can you still hear me okay and everything? Just type a smiley face or, or a comment or something into the chat so I can just see. That's, that, that's fine. Okay. So... Uh, of course, I'm assuming that you're all members of Computing at School. Uh, and and they, if you're not, you really, really should be because, well, there's lots of people like yourself out there offering and sharing resources and ideas. And um, and, and you'll see all sorts of discussions. I mean, I've, I have seen some things like 11.30 at night, I saw a teacher write a, a forum post saying, oh, I'm doing a lesson observation tomorrow as part of an interview. What kind of ideas have people got? And um, I, mean, I thought, gosh, would you really do that the night before an interview? But then the next morning, there was about 10, 15 different ideas that CAS members had responded to giving advice. One of the pieces of advice was, don't go on the internet the night before looking for ideas. But anyway. Now, when you're logged into the Computing at School you should, uh, community, you should be able to see your name over here. And when you click on that, that takes you to your profile page. Now, it's worth updating that from time to time because it may be that you, you're now working in a different school or you want to, to put an email address on there to allow people to get in touch with you. And any kind of roles and responsibilities that you're involved with. And you can also write a little bit of a, a biography about yourself to allow people to... Um, to, to think, find out a little bit more about you. Or that might be not your thing and you might want to keep it very private. But the reason why we're here now is I want to show you how you can manage the notifications to suit your needs. So next to your name, you should be able to see a little button that says Edit. And then once you scroll into there, you've got all these details about yourself, which you could now, if you want, remove or change some of them. But over here on the right-hand side is the bit I want to direct you to. So we've got the, 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 the sections that you can opt in or opt out of. So you can change your settings on there. But you can also decide how often you want to actually receive emails from CAS. So I've got it on once a day, and, and, and I get an email that comes through, I think it's about 1 in the morning. So that it's one of the first things I see of the day. However, that's... That's for most people is not enough just just to change that. I mean, do you really want to know that the new members 
join in all the time, do you want to really know that people are commenting on the resources? It, you might find that, that that's helpful or useful. But this, and, and also remember, if you do actually make any changes, there's a bit at the bottom where you need to click save, and then it will reflect those changes. But the thing I would really wanted to show you is, if you click on here, it says the main discussions page, there's a feature within there where you can opt in to certain types of discussions and it's here where it says edit subscriptions. So when I click on that now, you'll notice all these green and red ticks and crosses. So because I mostly teach in secondary, I don't, <laughs> not wishing to be unkind to teachers who are teaching computer and programming, but I don't really want to clutter my message my email every day with, with discussions going on there about teaching foundation skills, computing. Um, but that's not to suggest that other people might want to do so. Um, so you can see the kind of things that I, so I've, I've, I've subscribed to the include, um, which what we call these forums, so I can find out about diversity issues. Um, now, so they're like the main forums, but then as you go down, you'll also see these regional ones. So if you're in Jersey, you, you might want to switch that on. Um, and, and one of the things that's incredible about this is we've got the northeast there. We go to the northwest and look at. Okay, so I've subscribed to quite a few in the northwest. That's where I'm located. But as you go down, you start to see there's a. There's, I think there's about 140 of these altogether. So clearly, you'd be a bit mad to subscribe to all of them. And also, there's some buttons where you can now just switch all of them off. Again, once you've made those changes at the bottom, make sure that you click on Save. Okay. Now, just to make sure that you're not falling asleep, could you please, in the chat, maybe just type in one thing that you found quite helpful from the Computing at School community, like the forum, the discussions, one thing that you would recommend that people look at, it could be a particular resource or a discussion that's been of help to you. And that'll just give you a chance to breathe and go back and look at the agenda that I've got. Yeah, so Tony's saying discussion about GCSE coursework. Now, at, this to me has seemed to be one of the most active things I've been watching at the moment that there's a lot of discussions going backwards and forwards about how to actually solve particular tasks. And, excuse me, well, there's two ways of looking at it. There, there are teachers who are saying, come on, somebody, t please tell me how do I solve this problem? And then there's others saying, well, I'm thinking about solving it this way or the other. Um, so as far as teaching the GCSE, it's been really, really helpful. I also noticed there's been a couple of times in response to things that have been going on where people have been asking and making inquiries like who's teaching the AQA computing, computer science, who's teaching WJC, and that's a, that's a useful way of connecting. I mean, the, clearly, the OCR, the OCR computing GCSE is definitely one of the most popular ones. But if you, for whatever reason, have decided not to teach that one, you would want to know who's teaching the one that I've chosen. So it's it's a it's a useful way of connecting with people on there. Um, and of course, resources. Um, there's, there's, you know, loads and loads of resources, and also people commenting and evaluating resources. Now, I said that between now and half past, there was two other things I wanted to discuss. One of them is jam packed. I just want to give you a little brief introduction to what that is, and then we're going to try some hands-on and get you involved in um, a text-based programming assignment. So for about, oh, I don't know, three years or so, I've been organizing events and activities with different names. And I find people say to me often, well, why, why bother doing these things? I just find that the, the curriculum that we teach, even though we've got this new computing curriculum, the way that we teach in school, I find there's a lot of constraints and limits that we have to try and operate within. And, you know, I've had... <laughs> children in year seven who are wanting to, you know, work on things that are more challenging and demanding than my year 11s are. And then there's other people who, who, you know, are not interested at all. And I want to try and generate 
and inspire and, and engage their enthusiasm a little bit. So I started running a program of events outside school. So one of them was called Hack the Future. One of them was called Raspberry Jam. And the thing I joke about the jam was the jam spread very quickly because other people then liked that model. And we now have jams all over the world. And there was another one that we tried as well that works really well. It's the family hack jam. That's where families come in after school, like perhaps on a Friday evening. And they work together in teams, a bit like the, the Hack Manchester hackathon that I was talking about earlier. And um, now, one of my dreams or ambitions always was to, to, to try and roll that out and make it available and accessible to, to more communities. So I was really pleased to find out after you know writing lots of grant applications during the summer that the DFE, Department for Education, and the Raspberry Pi Foundation, and RM Education have all agreed to, to fund a program which is going to last for 18 months. Now, because I live in the north of England, just north, I'm about an hour north of Manchester, we're trying to focus our efforts and activities within, a, within that area around there, just to do with the practicalities of transporting Raspberry Pis and screens and laptops and things around. So we're focusing our efforts on an area from round about the middle of England, so the Midlands, Leicestershire, Lincolnshire, mid North Wales, right up to the sort of the southern reaches of Scotland, and then between the east and west coast. But in particular, we're trying to focus on schools where there's children there that either computing doesn't exist in their school curriculum, or there's no opportunities for them to, to access any kind of computing events or activities. And it may actually be that because it's an area where there's a lot of, you know, social deprivation. They, 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 it's not very easy for them to, you know, to travel into Manchester or Altrincham and take part in like a coder dojo or a code club. So we're trying to go out into the areas that we feel need us the most. Now I've got a link to some of the events that you can have a look at that we've already got listed online. So Yorkshire definitely is 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 within our catchment area. And um, like for example, we've got some events coming up in Hull. Um, 21st of November, 22nd of November, and then Eccles in Manchester, the 28th and 29th of November. And I'm really hoping that very, very soon we'll have a website. That I've been having chats with the web developers today, but there'll be a website on there which will have video footage, the resources that we're going to be using. So I'm having to write a whole lot of activities that for workshops, and we'll be sharing those all through the website. Now, if it sounds like the kind of thing that you might be interested in having at your school, maybe your next step might be to to try and come along to one of these activity uh, events that we're having. So some of them take place on a school day, like Hack to the Future, while others take place on a Saturday. And then the, the, the Hack Jams, they take place on a Friday evening. Um, I won't do this now, but if you were to click on some of those links later on, you can read descriptions about what's actually going to be happening at those places. So I'm in discussions with teachers in schools around the country at the moment. There's, there's a teacher in Birmingham who wants to have one there. And there's we're, we're planning to have one in Mansfield in April. Uh, there was somebody today contacting me from Lincolnshire. They want to have one maybe around Stamford. And another place in Manchester, Droylesden today. We've been talking about that. So the funding only covers us to do this for 18 months, which will be 18 different venues or host schools. And for the discussions at the moment, it looks like we've got five or six of these tied up. So I would imagine within a month or two, we will have agreed where they're all going to take place. So if it's the kind of thing that you really want to happen in, in, in your school or a school near you, I would say you need to try and get their top of the list, get, get to the to front of the queue, because I imagine the demand is going to be quite high for these. Now. Um, You'll see over time that I'll come back and mention a few things about Jam Pact. So I'll, we've not actually held one yet. We've held lots of the activities, but we haven't actually held a Jam Pact two-day festival. There's a blog post I published over the weekend, and there's a link to that, so you can read a little bit more about what I was saying. There's links to videos, so you can see the kind of things you would expect to happen within that. And also, um, I've also put a link to a thing called Meet the Geek. So Meet the Geek is a an activity or a workshop that will that will take place during the 
jam-packed festival. And it's a little bit like speed dating, except what we're not trying to do is we're not trying to pair, you know, 12 or 13 year old children up with adults. All we're trying to do is to give them an insight into what it's like to be a games developer, a graphic designer, a software developer, you know, that sort of thing. So like, for example, this gentleman here in this photograph, he had just finished working for Sony Computer Entertainment Europe in Merseyside. And what's interesting was I look at these photographs. These these children were in year eight at the time, and a huge portion of these now are are actually on the GCSE computing. They're in in year eleven studying GCSE computing. Um, these two developers here they worked for Barclays, and at the time they were showing off an app that they'd been working on called Ping It, which is now um, some of you who are Barclays customers will have seen it. And these two ladies here they work for a company called Double Negative who are responsible for all of the, the visual effects in films like Harry Potter's and um, Total Recall, and they brought props along. So they are a fantastic thing to have in your community if you can persuade senior leadership that it's a good idea. And, um, you know, so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to persuade as many people as possible to, to start talking about these things, and then hopefully we can make one happen at your school. Now, I'm running slightly over in time, but I wanted to show you one of the discussions I noticed on the Computing at School forum a while ago was people who found it difficult to install Python on the computers in their school. Now, I found a few different examples of where you can try Python within a browser, and one of these is called Sculpt. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to click here where it says Examples, and I'm going to show you a little bit of an example, and I'm going to ask you some questions about it. So I'm going to put a line in here and ask you just to ignore anything below that line for a moment. So just read through this code. This is Python. Um, and I want you to make a prediction about what you think might happen. So I'm going to spend about a minute thinking in your head, what could possibly happen? I'm going to execute this code in just a moment, make it slightly larger. And I want you to predict what might happen as an outcome of that. And once you've got your idea, you're going to type it into the chat, and I'm going to have a read through what you think, what, what your prediction is. I'm going to pause for a moment. Now, I really want full participation. We've got about 20 people on at the moment, a rough count. I'm hoping to see lots of you now reaching for your keyboard, and you're going to type in a prediction. Don't be shy. Okay, so we've got a, a few coming through now. Now, while you're thinking about that, I'm going to just scroll down slightly just so I can see. I'm now going to click on Sculpt, which will open now in another browser in the background while you're typing in what you think is going to happen. Okay. Now, just to give you a few clues that are, that are going on. So there is a turtle module within Python. Now it's not native to Python. That means like when you, when you first of all open Python up and you start using it, it's not automatically there. So import will bring that turtle module in. And then here we have what's called an assignment. So the letter T has just been chosen and we're assigning a turtle function to the letter T. So it means that in future when we use T, we're, we're saying T is an abbreviation of turtle dot turtle with a capital T bracket bracket. So you could put an argument in there. So I'm still reading your comments as they're coming through. So it does seem to be a fairly wide consensus that it's going to be drawing something. A lot of you have mentioned colors, steps, turning. Okay. Now we have here it says foresee in. And we have a list that follows that and then a colon. So for in is an aspect of flow control that we call iteration. So C is another variable, which is just a letter that's been chosen. It's going to iterate through this list here with these colors, red, green, blue, and yellow. And then what we haven't agreed on yet is it's, it is going to move forward. It is going to turn left. But we haven't agreed how often it's going to do that. Now. You might notice that I've this code is in 
it's actually in a word document sorry a word processed document which is my google documents that i'm using it means i can type things in now and share them with you and it and it dynamically updates that when i go and look at sculpt the the, the exact same code is there but because of the colors it would be more difficult for you to read that especially if this was on a whiteboard now in my classroom and it was a sunny day you'd have no chance of reading that so what i will do in a moment is i'm going to click on the run button and then there's a window below where it's going to output the outcome of this here so i'm going to scroll down slightly and click on the run button and we're going to test out your predictions Now, there is a slight lag when I'm using this click meet and software. So things don't always happen at the same speed in there. But you can now see that those people who predicted we were going to get a colored square. So something like Tony is probably going to go, yeah, yeah. Unless, of course, Tony's already done this before and he's shrugging his shoulders because he knows because he's tested it. Now, what I'm going to do this time is I'm going to go back to that original code that I showed to you, which is in here. I'm going to make some changes this time. And I'm then going to ask you to predict what, what's going to be different. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to take that out. Um, let's see. Let me try this and this. Okay. So if I just go back and show you, we had a square with four different colored sides. This time I've changed the code slightly and I'm going to ask you to predict what's going to happen this time. So there should be some differences, some changes. So I'm going to pause while you think about that. So I expect that you're typing a message into the chat now where you're predicting what's going to happen next. Now, one of the, things, the limitations of this platform is I can't see people's faces or hear their voices. So I would imagine that when Linda Owen said smaller square, she probably would have said smaller square. Well, I'm not really sure. And as a teacher in the classroom, I'd probably go for that one to begin with. And I'd, and I'd, be, say, and I'd be discussing it with Linda, saying, oh, so why would you say a square? Because we had a square before. Would this still be a square? And what do we know about squares? We know that squares have got four sides, four equal sides. And why why did it iterate before round? Why would why did it do it four times? Why did it not do it twice or once or, or five times? Notice I haven't given the solution out straight away. We're just we're just having a discussion going on. Now, as we look through the chat, a few people have mentioned triangle. And I might say, Mike, you said a triangle, but you know, you kind of shrugged a little bit when you said it. You're, you're, you know, you. I, I don't think you're Australian, but when you said it, you went a triangle, like that, and your voice went up at the end, which suggested that you were asking me a question. Why, why, why would you be asking whether it was a triangle? Oh, perhaps because you're not absolutely certain. So, and I might then say, Craig, you also said a triangle. Why? And Craig then might say to me in the classroom and say, Well, sir, before when we did it, it had four different colours in it. This time, it's just got three colors. OK, they're not all different, but it's three. So maybe this time, it's going to be a three-sided shape. And straight away, when I think of three-sided shape, I think of triangle. OK, so what we're going to do now is we're going to test out that prediction. So this time, I'm going to copy all of this from my Google document. Like this. I go over to my sculpt. I scroll up here. I'm going to just clear the output. And then I paste it in on top of that one. Now, I'm not sure how easily you can see this. But it's got color syntax highlighting. So, for example, import is a Python function, so it recognizes that and it changes it to orange. And so, I'm about to click on run to find out. So, when I click on run in a moment, we should see the shape. And I'm still going back to read what you've written in the chat. So, here we go. We click on run. Oh, now. A lot of you said triangle. That that looks like a very peculiar triangle to me. So perhaps your predictions were incorrect then. I wonder why. Why would it be? Now oh oh right, okay. So I can hear you saying that a triangle has got six you know, an equilateral triangle's got sixty degrees. If you do that three times, you would think 
what if? Hmm. Were they internal angles? Were they? Oh, I just realized maybe I wasn't actually showing you what the shape looked like. Um, so, <laughs> so if it's not going to draw a triangle, what would we need to do this time to change it so that it does draw a triangle? Maybe we need to go back and modify that. So if I show you the code again that we had, maybe we need to modify this in some way. So in my classroom, the way I do this is I, I have them working in pairs. I say, no, maybe your partner knows what it is and you don't. So you're going to have a little whisper conversation with your partner where you're going to say, oh, yeah, um, it needs to be 100 degrees. And your partner goes, no, not 100 degrees. Yeah, no. Oh, right. So have one of them conversations now with your partner to find out what is it, what, why did it not do what, what you were expecting and, and what angle would you need to change it to. And, and now the next thing you're going to do is you're going to type into the chat what you think you would need to type in to make it do that. So I'm um, okay. So we've got a, a couple of proposals there that that seem to be the same kind of thing. A D times three. Mm, that's interesting. I'm not really sure what that's going to do. I'm just going to plug something in here. Now, prediction is something that I try to use quite a lot in my teaching now because I found that when I first started teaching computing, I probably didn't have the right idea. I started off by telling children, well, look, if you do this and you do this, this is what you get. And what I got was, so what? Triangles, squares, mm -hmm. so what? But I actually found with prediction, it was, I don't know, it just feels that little bit more engaging when you say to me, ah, now, you know, for example, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to hide it. And what I need to do is I need to hide my sharing for a minute. And now that you can't see what I've done, I'm going to go and make some changes to my code. It may be that as I'm making the changes, I might accidentally put in a syntax error that you might spot straight away. Or maybe you won't spot it straight away. It might take you a moment to see. So now I'm going to go back to sharing the full screen again. Okay. Now, in a moment, my screen should appear in front of you. And now what I've done is so I set to change it to 120 degrees. So I've done that. But you know what I've done at the same time? I've gone and modified a few other things there. So before we can test it, I think I might get a syntax error if I go to execute that code. So could you just have a discussion with your partner? OK, clearly you can't have a discussion with your partner because your partner is not sat next to you. But imagine you're now in a discussion with your partner where your partner is saying to you, oh, yeah, um, I've spotted a mistake on line two. What? Line two? Line two is blank. There's nothing on. Look, line two is blank. Oh, sorry, uh, I mean three or one. So what you're going to do is you're going to type in in the chat, can you spot any syntax errors in my code, anything that might cause it some problems now? Now, while you're thinking about it, I'm just going to reduce this number here slightly. So that if it does draw a little triangle on the screen, it should, we should be able to see all of it. Have you gone to sleep? Come on, you should be now typing in the chat. What have I done? I've just gone in and sabotaged my code so that now it, won't, it may not work exactly the same. So Craig's come up with two errors that he spotted. And he seems to agree with Carol and Sue. So we've got an agreement there. So just to save a little bit of time, because we're going to move on to something else in a moment, I'm now going to agree with you that, yes, there should be no capital C there. Or at least if that's a capital C, this should also be a capital C, because they're both referring to the same object. So we should have some consistency there in our the use of our case. So I've corrected that one. Um, Gray, well, you see, if you're American, and I think the person who created the turtle module may have been American. That's how they spell gray in America. Now, what I can do is I can change it to G-R-E-Y, but that might cause us a problem. So we'll find out about that one in a moment. I'm just going to leave it as G-R-A-Y. 
but I've given you a clue to something else talking about American things. And you know what? I think I've managed to outfox you all because there's still two more errors in there that have not been spotted yet. <gasps> Dan's shouting colour, but he's shouting it with an American accent because Dan thinks that colour should be spelled C-O-L-O-R. Now, Dan, in our school at the moment, you know that we're, we're, we've got a big drive on literacy. Um, why would you be telling me to spell colour the wrong way? Oh, yes, you're right. Yeah, so if, in case you didn't hear that, Dan has just said that in America they spell colour slightly differently. So um, if you're struggling to find opportunities to teach literacy or, or a, a focus on literacy in your class, then um, there, there's an example of something you can do. Now, we've got another suggestion from Craig. He thinks that this year should be a semicolon. I was kind of winking at me now when I do that. Um, we're, we're not, that's not necessarily the thing I was looking for you. I'm, I'm not sure the semicolon would make any difference. Um, <laughs> okay, but the, the other thing that I've done it is to do with a capitalization. And you know what? I think I've won because nobody spotted it. So the issue was up here, I gave it a capital T. Now, without correcting that, I'm going to copy all of this. I'm going to paste it into Sculpt just to see what happens. So I'm going to clear my output and I'm going to select everything within that window and paste my code just there on top. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell it to run. Oh dear. Wah, 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 wah. There is no object, so no module, sorry, called turtle. So now I'm going to modify that to a lowercase t. And now I'm going to clear the output and run again. So you all thought you were uh, really clever. You could spot my errors. And look, we have an equilateral triangle. And look, we also have a gray line. Gray, <laughs> spelt G-R-A-Y. What would happen if I change it to E-Y? Oh, it's a certain color and it hasn't changed. Here, let's try it. So all I've done is I've just cleared the output. And I'm going to click Run in a moment. So could you please type into the chat? Now I've I spelt gray the the UK British way, not the American way, which is G R A Y. Tell me your prediction. What do you think is going to happen now that we've corrected it or incorrected it? I'll pause for a moment. Tammy thinks it accepts both of them. Hmm. I wonder why Tammy would say that. Maybe Tammy has used this before. Blank where gray should be. Ooh, I like all these different answers that you're coming up with. And this is the kind of thing that goes on in my classroom when we're discussing it. So you can see. You know, and so another, I don't use the wah, wah, wah teaching uh, strategy. But one of the things I do use is I use the uh, suspense. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to move my mouse over where it says run. And you know what? Before I do that, what I might do in my classroom is I might say, right, all those people who think we're going to get a gray line, hands up. Okay, so there's 30 people in the classroom. We've got about 12 who put their hand up. I am, by the way, in an empty classroom here in school, just in case you didn't know. And so, so that means the other 18 people in the class think that we're not going to get a gray line. You think we're going to get something different. So Dan, Dan Gardner, because there's lots of Dans in this classroom. Dan Gardner, you put your, what, what do you think you're, you're going to get? You think we're going to get a black line? Okay, right, not, not really sure about that one, Dan. And um, Melissa, what do you think? You think we're going to get a? You think we're going to get a syntax error? Why would he get a syntax error? Because it doesn't recognise that. Okay, right. Hands up if you agree with Dan. No, you already said you thought we agree. Okay, so this is the kind of thing we do where we like probe and test with each other. So, so we've now got th everybody in the class is in one of three camps. They either think we're going to get no line, a syntax error, or a grey line. So I'm about to click on the run button now. I wonder how long we can pause and wait for, because I haven't actually clicked the run button yet. But I hope in some way that you're kind of, come on, come on, I want to know, I want to know, I want to know if I'm right. A little bit like when you're in a pub quiz and there's a bit of disagreement over whether it was um, Brian Ferry or Frankie Valli who, who sang in the Four Seasons. You go, no, it definitely it's Frankie Valli. No, I'm sure it was Brian Ferry. So I'm about to click on the run button now to find out what happens. 
but I haven't clicked on it yet because I'm just pausing. <laughs> okay, we've got people in the chat saying, do it, do it. So here we go. Scroll down. Oh, look, Tammy, you can go and punch the air because we've still got a gray line. Now, I've never actually done this before. So Tammy, I have to take my hat off to you and say, well done. It did actually accept both. Now I wonder, I wonder if I was to change color to the English version of color would accept that. Ooh, oh, I wonder. Right, let's do this quickly because I'm, I'm kind of, I want to know this myself now. So, so I've changed color now in here to C-O-L-O-U-R. I know it's going to be hard for you to read that. The way that that would look is it would look like this here. So it's got a U and it doesn't have that uppercase T up there. So come on, everybody, just go for it. You can, it's either going to accept it or it's not going to accept it. So you're going to type in like, yes, it will definitely accept it. Or no, it won't. So Simon, you're you're confident it's going to accept the UK spelling of color. Carol, you're going against the flow. <laughs> so Carol, you might be the only one who gets it right, or the only one who gets it wrong. So I've cleared the output. We've got color spelled C O L O U R, and we click run. Oh, Carol, look at that. Go on, run around the room and uh, do a do a lap of honor. Turtle has no attribute called color, so it does only accept the American one. Now, isn't that interesting? It accepts both spellings of gray, but only one spelling of color. I'm starting to get a little bit geeky on this. I just wondered if we just typed in anything like GY, what would happen? I'm just going to test that myself just to see. So, ah, <laughs> interesting. I saw this time I typed in GY as a color. And it didn't, it, I don't know what GY is, but we've got two red lines and one blue line. Right, now I'm hoping that's some kind of activity that you think you might try with a class. Uh, Craig was on here earlier and Craig was saying, you know, he's looking for ideas, things he can do in his new job. <laughs> so um, anyway, so all of the resources that you need for that now are linked into that document that we were using. And that's really, that was supposed to just take us half an hour, that bit. Now, so you can see I've run over slightly. So um, while it, as I'm about to move on to the next segment, what I'd love you to do now is if you think that that would be useful, that activity that I've just shown you to use with the class, if you could just type something in the chat and say, yeah, I'm, you know, although I'm on half-time holiday this week, I've got my year nines on the Monday morning, the first time I'm back, I'm going to try that with them. That's what I'm hoping you can type something like that into the chat. Bear in mind, everything that we're doing at the moment, you've now got the license to try these with the class. If you just watch this webinar thing and you never actually use any of these, a lot of them are just going to go in one ear or one eye or whatever and then out the other. What I started off myself was I would, I would see something. I wonder if I could try that with a class. So I might think, well, um, I've got year seven on Tuesday morning to read one. And they're the, they're the like, top set year seven. I think I'll try it with them, first of all, because if it doesn't quite work out, at least I know what I've got to do differently the next time I try it with my year nines or whatever. So I would really, really encourage you to try and experiment things with your classes. So, um, so Carol, predict and probe. So I mentioned that, I think, in last week's uh, webinar that I did. I was Last week, I was at a school in Altering, and I was doing my... SLE core training and I was watching a math class and I noticed they were doing some things similar to what I was doing in my computing class but they had a name for it they called it um, they had a name for it which I've forgotten so they had I think five steps they were saying pause uh, sorry the first one was pause so you pose a question to the class then you pause to let them think about what their answer might be and then I think their next one was to probe you, I'm gonna have to look back at my notes <laughs> It's in there somewhere where I discuss them. Webinar two. Mm, it's in there somewhere. Oh gosh, I've forgotten where I've put it. But it. So, uh, partner. That was another one. Discuss it with your partner, and then to share it with the class. But one of the things I've tried to do a few times is I try to unsettle people a little bit because I want to know how secure their understanding is. So, like for example, pounce and bounce. Yes, yes. 
they were the ones pause, bounce, and pounce, and they attributed those to Dylan Williams. They'd heard it, but I've added a few others in. So we had pose, pause, pounce, and bounce. That's exactly it. But the other ones I was saying was probe. So the probe is the. So tell me, you think we're going to get a square? Why, why, why would you say that? And then the other one I've done, which is the, um, I don't know the name for it. It was when I was a bit more focused on it. I would actually try to un, 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 destabilize people with, with, with their correct answers. So like Dan Gardner teaches computing. He should really know that this is going to do it. Let's say, now, Dan, there was a light, slight bit of doubt in the tone of your voice when you said it a moment ago. And Dan would then go, um, see, you're really thinking it could be other. And you can sometimes manage. It's like you're, you're digging a pit for people and you're luring them down into this pit, which has got these big spikes at the bottom. And then sometimes last minute they manage to, no, no, I'm going to go back and stick with what I want. And then, um, but the, the lovely thing about this type of activity is like, for example, when I modeled with, with, with the gray, when I spelled gray, the American way and the English way, I myself had no idea, absolutely no idea whether it was going to be one or the other. And it may have seemed like I was acting it, but I wasn't. I, I literally did not know what was going to happen next. Um, and exactly the same with the color. I did not know at that point what was going to happen. So you may have seen, if you watched last week, you may have seen me do this thing where A is 1, B is 2, add them together, multiply them, and, and, and all this kind of thing. So, Linda, what you've written, that, that, that's brilliant. I, I would say as well, please don't wait till 2015 to try these, because these things will just be distant memories. Even if you've got classes at the moment that are doing ICT or you're teaching in business studies, just say to the class, look, Right, the door is shut. For the next 15 minutes, we're just going to try this exercise activity. But miss, sir, why are we doing this now? Just because we can. You know, it's just a bit of fun. I want to see who's really good at solving problems. You know, it's a bit like Sudoku or cryptic crosswords. But as you're doing that, you're now starting to model. How am I going to pitch this thing to my class? I've, I've shown you a way that I would do this with my class. But you're not like me. You've got your own way. You'll have better ways of doing it than I have. Now, I need to move back to our agenda. So everything I've done tonight is being recorded. And later on, what will happen is the recording will go online. Um, I've, I've actually gone off our agenda slightly in terms of our timing. But I think that was quite useful, the, 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 the American spellings and what, what effect that would have. In, our, in last week's uh, webinar, some people were saying, so how do you prepare your classes for the programming assignment, the A453? So what I'm planning to do, this is GCSE now we're talking about. I plan to spend a minute or two talking about that. Um, I'm going to show you another example of something that I think I'll have to go into more detail in our next webinar, which will now be on the 11th of November, not the 10th. And I'll, I'll give you a little bit of an introduction to that, and then I'm going to go and answer Craig's question. So if you look through the OCR GCSE computing specification, you will find um, a list that looks like this. And it's a list of the programming requirements for the for GCSE computing. Now, when you look at the list, you, you, you might be tempted to go, oh my goodness, there's things on there I've never heard of. Or you might go, actually, that, that, that's, that's quite a concise list, really. I can, you know, I can really see how, how you know, I'm, I would be teaching that to my children. So I'm going to discuss this in the context of the year 10 GCSE computing class that I'm teaching at the moment. And Craig, these webinars, they're, they're almost every week at the moment. There's nine between October and December. And if you look at the very top of the document, you'll see a link to when future ones are going to be on. They're all listed online. So I have a year 10 class at the moment. There's 22 children in it, about eight girls and 14 boys. Yeah. And each week, uh, what I've mentioned in previous webinars, how I'm teaching the theory, but each week at the moment, I'm building up the children's confidence and knowledge and experience of these, these different elements, uh, requirements. So, so far, my classes, if, I, if I'm just going to mess this list up a little bit now, I could say to my class, you know, um, describe what's going on here. And a good core of the class will say, oh, you've created a variable that's called A. You've assigned a value of 1 to that. And um, what I could do is I could show them like this. And I could say, uh, what's different this time? And again, a, a strong core of the group, they say, well, 
That should do exactly the same thing, but what you've not done is you've not put spaces either side of the operator. Now, a year 10 class, we've got five lessons a fortnight. We're just up to the half term holiday, and let me just see if I can tell you how many lessons we've had so far. I have a link to my class here, class notes. And all these class notes are available online. I'm not sure how much use they are to you, but you can, at any time, you can go and have a look at what I'm planning. So they've had 15 lessons so far. It's their eighth week. And the things we've been doing in, in the lesson at the moment have been things like adding binary numbers together. And they're trying to now build a calculator using Python. But what I've been demonstrating with them is, well, if I go back to my list, is these kind of things here. So if you said something like A equals input, what is the first number? And then B was, was something similar. It was like, what's the second number? They, they're building a calculator that can, like, say, uh, print uh, a, the, <laughs> the first number. Uh, well, you get the idea. First number added to second number is equal to, and then they would try and do A plus B. They might find that they don't get exactly what they want. So what they might have to do is they might have to say, do this instead. They might have to make a line that would then say C equals A plus B, and then do that here. And that's the kind of thing that we've been practicing up to now. Now, to do so, we've been looking at variables, operators, inputs, outputs, and assignments. So this is 15 lessons, the, the, the kind of level that we're at at the moment. And that's just a very basic example of, of, of what we've been doing. I've also been showing them a little bit about the future because we started adding in conditionals. We haven't really looked at iteration yet. I think iteration is a far more powerful concept, but it's also quite a challenging one to um, to, to, to get to grasp, especially if you've not really understood what sequence and conditionals are. Um, the question that somebody just asked in the other webinar is, Tammy, that right at the very top, you'll find links to, to previous recordings. And if you scroll all the way down, you'll find them. But the iteration it, it is more of a challenge. So at the moment, we've just been doing, like, so we've got here, we've got sequencing. And then the other thing we start to do now is, like, what if the person said, so like, um, operator equals. Now I haven't really given this a thought, so I think I'm going to put some mistakes in. It's like, so it could be like, do you want to multiply, divide, add, or subtract? And then the 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 the, the user would answer in some way. Like they might say multiply, divide, and then we we'll say, ah, well, if operator equals um, add and then we can say and we can indent that and indent this and then what would happen is it would then add c b and a together to make c which is the and you could have like answer because a and b to be honest are not really good names for the variables in this case but these are little things that we're looking at at the moment. I mean, we've got something that works, and then we would talk about how can we modify it. Would it be, how readable is it? Would we be better off column A, first number instead? You know, this kind of thing. So this is what I've been doing with my year 10 to the moment. The question was, how do you prepare your classes for A453, the program and assignment? And this is an example of after, what did I say, 15 lessons? Is that what I said before? Um, yeah, after 15 lessons, we're kind of at this, this level at the moment. We've also pretty much understood what sequence and condition, well, I should say we're, we're only just looking at conditionals. And then we definitely, we're not up to any kind of loops at the moment. But after the half-term holiday, I'm going to ask them, could they, could they have some kind of a feature where it would say, do you want to try it again? And it would then repeat it at, at, at the end. So that would add in things like count control loops. We've just been looking at loops ourselves in Sculpt. We, we, had a, we had a list and we were, you could say, 
looping through that list or we were iterating through that list. Basic stream manipulation, we've hardly done any of this. And certainly we've not covered any of these elements here. Now, there is no way that I would consider starting A453 unless the children have had even a basic understanding in these, these kind of things here. Oh, D, data types. We've covered strings in, and integers. We just touched on real numbers and Boolean a little bit. So we were setting up a flag if something's true or false. We would do this. So my plan will be when we come back after a half term holiday, I'm going to. I'm wondering about using with the OCR uh, past tasks, the ones that are no longer alive. So there's, there's one to be in a gaming room to make a model of a dice. Um, I think I'm actually going to use that in class, but it's going to start building up to it to be able to complete that sign assignment when a much reduced time frame where I will give them some, some of the some of this solutions, solutions to an extent. So like, like here's a flow here's chart, a chart in the middle and gaps. That's, that's a really simple, really simple example. example. Okay, okay. Right, right. Okay, so we have some messages, messages sound, 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 bad, bad. bad. So, so and pausing, pausing or a moment. So, so, so hello, 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 hello. Let me Let know me when, when the sound, the sound is back on, on again, again, please. please. Okay. Okay. Mm, okay. Okay. So this might just be temporary. Fingers crossed. Now I found last week when this happened, the actual recording quality was okay, but it seemed to be that the quality of when people were receiving it wasn't. So okay. as we're just slightly over. Okay, so we're just over time now. I'm thinking about picking this up next time. Yeah, so I'll just retract slightly, I'll just go back slightly to where I was, where I think the sound went, and then I'll get to a point of, I'll answer one of those questions that we had, and then we'll wrap it up. Okay, so what I was saying just a moment ago before the sound went was, each week in our lessons, we're having these little coding drills, little exercises. I call them coding dojos. And there's a, there's a, a, a massive emphasis on them collaborating and coding together. Yeah. We, haven't, we haven't really actually done enough of sort of algorithm design and pseudo coding. Because I, I wanted them, we were spending a lot of time discussing the theoretical elements in the lesson. So I wanted to keep flipping between theory and some practical hands on coding after all. That's why a lot of them have chosen this subject because they're expecting that they're going to be bashing away, building up bits of code on the computer. That's not very technically worded, but you know what I mean. So in lessons, we've been doing a lot of paired coding, drivers and navigators. And at the moment, the drivers and navigators are still, they've, they've chosen who they're going to work with, but there's going to come a point where I'm going to start to force certain pairs to work together to do with, um, I'm, there's going to be some ability matching where I'm going to have people with a slightly staggered ability rather than having like an A star working with an E grade, which would be too dramatic a, a difference. We'll have like the A star working with an A, the A working with a B, the B working with a C. So there's always just this slight shift. And one of the things I do in my uh, devious ways is I skew the timing segment slightly as well. So when they're working in pairs and it seems like they've got an equal amount of time, actually the one who's slightly stronger always gets a little bit extra more time to do the navigation while the other person's doing the driving. Now I haven't really mentioned a lot about driving navigating tonight, but the basic um, pretext is the navigator almost sits there with their arms folded. Sometimes they, they gesticulate a lot, but they're not allowed to touch the keyboard and the mouse, while the driver is the one who's sat at the computer and they only do what the navigator tells them to. So what I was saying just a few moments ago when the sound started to go a little bit awry was 
I'm planning to start working on the A453 controlled assessment around about the February half term in 2015. But to build up to that, I'm considering giving them a past OCR computing assignment. It's either going to be the one about dog and cat ages, which is a specimen task. It's freely available online. Or I'm going to give them the game encounter one that has just recently been complete, like finished, withdrawn, the withdrawn controlled assignment, which is um, all about a dice, simulating a dice, how many sizes the dice got, that kind of thing. Now, um, I'm just going to see what questions have come through, and then I'm going to wrap it up for tonight. There is another one of these. Um, on, it's going to be on the 11th of November. I haven't changed the date yet, but it, I can't now do it on the 10th of November. So I'm going to have to let everybody know it'll be on the 11th, Tuesday the 11th, 6 o'clock till 7. Um, Tammy asks, A453 has got three parts, the course, two years. Do you expect to get all three sections of A453 done this year? So what, I'm, what I expect is the model that I've run lots of times before is we start A453 around about the February half term in year 10. So that's so we've we've got the traditional two year GCSE five hours a fortnight three hours in week A two hours in week B and um, what I will do is I will we'll start going for real in February half by after February half term and that's when I'll try I'll try to plan to have them twenty hours for the assignment with just a few interruptions in between. And my year 11s I've got at the moment, they're just finishing off A453. They, they, had a, they had a bit of a disjointed year last year with a different teacher in year 10. And most of them now are just come to the end of A453. Ideally, I would have liked to have started in this term A452. So now, I had a question earlier on, which I'm just going to jump straight to now. That, that was from Craig Walton. And Craig was looking for as much guidance as possible before January to start a new school. So my advice, Craig, would be <laughs> silence. Yeah. My advice would be to, to try and not do what sometimes happens when you're in a supermarket. You go shopping and you're starving and you can smell the bread and you see all, like, all this food around and you end up just you're shopping with your stomach, really, instead of shopping with your head. Why am I using that analogy? Because, again, if you go on the uh, the Compute with School community, there's just so much traffic going on there. People saying, oh, I use this and I use that. And I would say, Craig, the best thing you can really do at the moment is just to take one small thing, almost like a seed, and plant that seed and, and, and practice it lots and lots of times. Like, for example, the thing I was showing you earlier, the, the exercise with, the, with Sculptor, code sculptor, uh, sorry, sculpt.org, just, just start using that with some classes now and build up on it. it there are some things in there that you, will, you might not, if, if, if you're relatively new to computing, there'll be some things that you just do not understand yet, but you can break it lots. Like what happens if you remove them spaces there? Does that have any effect? Well, it makes it read differently. What happens if I take the spaces out here? Does that have an effect? You know, And, and start trying it with classes. If you, if you look at Sculpt as well, when I was showing you earlier, what we didn't explore was, this is just exercise one of eight altogether. <laughs> Eight's a bit scary when you look at it. Yeah? It's all to do with, it looks like uh, documents, uh, I forgot what it's called, D, the DOM. It's a way of structuring a, a web page. Um, document something model. Exercise seven looks scary, but if you go back down to look three and two, they don't look quite as bad as as, as as seven and eight do. So there we've got one, you know, try and predict and see what would happen there. So I would really, really say, just start with one small thing and start building up on it, um, pretty much. Now, I'm, I think it's about time for me now to finish and pack this up for tonight. If there's any more questions, you've got like a, a 30 seconds or so. The school network manager will allow, not allow Python school. Yes, that would tell me that was the reason why we were looking at Sculpt tonight in response to those people who say, my network manager won't let us use Python. Well, why do you need a new network manager 
or you need to try and show them that it's not quite as scary or as bad as, as you might think. But in the interim period, till you manage to persuade that person to change their mind, scoped is one solution that you've got in your artillery that you can use. And there are some discussions on the Compute in School forum about how do you persuade a network manager that actually having Python idle available in the network is no more um, you know, no more risk to the school security than having Microsoft Word on there. Because if there are children on there in your school and what they're going to do is they're going to do everything they can to bring the network down, they don't need Python to do that. They can do it with notepads. They can do it with shortcuts. They can do it with Word. They can just write a little batch file in Word, say, well, I'm not going to tell you how to do that, but um, Python is going to make your your network no more vulnerable than than anyway. And the other thing is find out who those children are, set them a little exercise, and then recruit them to be your digital leaders. So uh, anyway, thank you very much, everybody, for, for joining us. Um, we're we're done. I'm going to say goodbye and stop the recording. Um, all of the previous recordings, even if you didn't sign up for them, are, are available in that document. They're all on YouTube. I'm happy for you to share those with people, but within the context of the notes. Oh, look, there's a, a little preview of what Jampack is going to look like. So I'm just looking for my record button now, and I'm going to stop the recording. What you should find in a, in, a, in a day or so, this recording will be available online. On YouTube, it's Techno Teacher, T-E-K-N-O Teacher. But again, you'll find a link to that in the document. So the recording should start.